Welcome back. This is the Dell P2212H, a 22-inch Full HD 60Hz TN monitor from, I don't know, 2011-ish? No, don't worry, I'm not reviewing it. I found this P2212H on Craigslist for a mere $25, and while it was mistreated a bit during its former life, it still works, which is the important part. But why buy this? To answer that, I need to back up to one of my previous reviews, the ViewSonic XG270. I complained in that review, and I've been complaining for a while now, that monitor manufacturers are being very stubborn about not allowing strobing at 60Hz. The TV guys don't care, they've been offering 60Hz strobing for years. But for gaming monitors, unless you can find one of those old BenQ XL series from around 2014, there are no current displays that support strobing ULMB BFI at 60Hz. For a CRT nerd like me, that's hugely disappointing. ViewSonic got very close to CRT clarity with their XG270, but without the ability to strobe at 60Hz, it can't be a true CRT replacement. So since they're not going to give me what I want, I was thinking, how hard could it be to add a backlight strobing to a monitor? Well, since I don't want to destroy an actual nice monitor, the P2212H will be the guinea pig for my DIY backlight strobing experiment. But why in particular did I choose this P2212H? The first reason is that I was intrigued by the Full HD TN panel. Obviously Dell isn't going to put their fastest gaming TN panel in an office monitor, but I was hoping I'd get a hidden TN gem. If its response times were anywhere near as fast as the 24GM79Gs, which is still the best monitor CAD-wise I've tested, I was thinking I could DIY a fantastic 60Hz strobing mode. The second reason is that this Dell is an LED edge-lit monitor. Fooling around with CFL ballasts isn't something that sounded fun to me. LEDs, on the other hand, are relatively easy to drive and also easy to turn off. And the last reason is that the P2212H has an analog VGA input. That won't be important for this video, but I'll get to that later. But getting back to that first part, before I started tearing the monitor apart, I wanted to check its response times, so I ran it through my measurement suite. With no overdrive settings at all, and only one refresh rate, 60 Hz, Octave only spit out 144 charts this time, 72 with linear data and 72 with RGB. Unlike the other reviews that have thousands of charts, because there are so few for this one, I strongly recommend you download the charts and have a look. This TN panel's behavior is fascinating. Some transitions are amazing. Let's look at a few falling transitions. Here's the transition from RGB 191 to black. This is bonkers fast. Two milliseconds after the fall begins, it's already at RGB 7, and the CAD for this transition is an amazing 20.4. But see how the response kind of hovers around RGB 7 until 16.7 milliseconds later, where it finally goes to black? This odd shelf behavior will keep showing up, and it's why the P2212H's overall CAD average will prove to be very bad. Here's RGB 223 to 95. Oh dear. The P2212H has no overshoot. In fact, it's exhibiting undershoot behavior. For the first 60 Hz frame, 16.7 milliseconds, the panel is only driving down to RGB 123, where it sits until the frame is complete. For the next full frame, it again undershoots, this time to RGB 100. The third frame yet again undershoots, so its full response time is off the chart on the x-axis at 50.6 milliseconds. This CAD of 131.6 is very bad, and it looks bad too. With some proper overdrive, this could have been an amazing panel, but there's nothing in the OSD or even in the service menu to adjust. As I run through these responses, it keeps getting worse. RGB 255 to 127, CAD of 214.4, is something from one of my nightmares. This undershoot behavior is disastrous. Rise times are not much better, again with this undershoot behavior. RGB 31 to 223 takes so long to reach the target, the marker has again gone completely off the right edge. Overall, the P2212H has an average CAD of 103, which makes it the worst monitor I've tested so far. Not a good start. So it measures bad, but how does it look in motion? Also bad. Non-strobed 60fps is always just a smear when eye tracking due to sample and hold blur. But for the Dell here, everything is especially smeary. The ViewSonic XG270 for comparison, also at 60fps, behaves much better. When I saw the response charts, I lost all hope that I'd be able to turn the P2212H into an amazing 60Hz strobe display. 
many of the transitions take 50 or more milliseconds to complete, and with the backlight pulses happening every 16.7 milliseconds, ghosting is inevitable. Even if every other aspect of my DIY strobing were done perfectly, panel scanout speed and pulse duration, I can't work around the slow panel, and that means I'm definitely not going to beat the XG270. Speaking of those other aspects, another issue is the slow panel scanout. Like a CRT or any fixed refresh rate display, the Dell P2212H paints its screen from top to bottom, and it does so linearly across the full frame duration. At 60 Hz, whatever gray to gray transition we're trying to achieve happens 16.7 milliseconds later at the bottom of the screen than at the top. So, no matter when you pulse the backlight, you'll always catch some portion of the transition still occurring. That's why we get strobe crosstalk. And this would happen even if the LCD had near-perfect response times. The crosstalk effect comes about from mixing an instantaneous global shutter backlight pulse with the rolling shutter LCD transitions. One way to solve this would be to use a scanning or segmented backlight. Samsung actually tried this with their CFG series, and I'll talk about whether or not I can do that with the Dell later. Another way is just to speed up the top-to-bottom LCD painting. Interestingly, this is already what every high refresh rate adaptive sync display is doing when in its variable refresh range, and you may have heard of it referred to as quick frame transport. For instance, the Y27Q20, a 165Hz monitor, paints its screen from top to bottom in only 6.16 milliseconds. But even when you're playing something at 60 FPS, those frames are still sent at the full 165Hz link speed and painted down the screen just as fast as at 165 FPS. For the leftover 10.6 milliseconds, the panel is simply waiting for the next frame. As a quick aside, watch the white to black transition on both monitors. Quick frame transport on the IPS Lenovo allows the entire screen to start falling faster, but it takes several frames for it to fully converge to black. The Dell TN, though, is ridiculously fast on this transition. Check out the octave charts for both. Two milliseconds after the transitions begin, the TN is all the way down to RGB 31, while the IPS is at RGB 168. Oh, so much potential for this panel, wasted. Anyway, high max refresh rates, 165 Hz, 240 Hz, 280 Hz, allow this QFT behavior when gaming with Adaptive Sync, which is great for us because it minimizes lag across the entire frame. But that overhead is critically important for strobe displays because it also minimizes the differences between the top and bottom of the panel. Getting back to the ViewSonic, because the panel scanout is so fast on the XG270, a theoretical 60 Hz strobe every 16.7 milliseconds would allow ample time for all of the pixels from top to bottom to complete their transitions in darkness, leading to a very clean, crosstalk-free strobed image. But the Dell P2212H is old-school 60 Hz. I can't overclock it, I can't increase the vertical total, I've got no way to speed up the panel scanout. So now I have two problems. A lot of very slow pixel transitions, coupled with the slow scanout speed. It is unfortunately impossible to get a clear strobed image with the Dell. But let's pretend like those aren't showstoppers and address the final aspect of proper backlight strobing, the pulse duration. I mentioned in my XG270 review that real clarity advances happen when the backlight is strobed for shorter and shorter durations. On that monitor, with pure XP set to ultra, the backlight was only pulsed for 0.85 milliseconds, which led to stunning clarity, but it paid for that with brightness, only achieving a very dim 70 nits. The XG270 could hit 400 nits continuously, but my little office monitor here, at its brightest, can only put out 220. So to hit my 100 nit goal, even with a longish pulse of 2 milliseconds, I'm going to have to run a ton of current through the LED strip. LEDs, of course, can be overdriven at low duty cycles, but not with uh, 7 times as much current. So, considering all that, this is clearly not going to work. But uh, let's start taking this thing apart. The back plastic housing is held on by four screws, which are easy enough to remove. But the tricky part is getting off the front bezel, which is held in place by plastic clips all around the border. I did a little damage to the plastic while digging around to pry the bezel off, but there was a reason this thing was only 25 bucks. The OSD buttons are connected via a ribbon cable to the controller board, and once I unplug the internal USB connector, the front bezel comes free. But let's look more closely at the back. 
On the left side is a six lead cable that connects the LED driver board with the edge LED strip. The two red wires in the center carry 33 volts and there are four return wires. This LED strip came from a different monitor, but it's similar enough to what's inside the Dell. The strip contains 44 total LEDs in four banks of 11. These SMD white LEDs drop about 2.8 volts each, so that's why the drive voltage has to be so high, 33 volts to light 11 LEDs in series. The strip runs the whole left side, from the back of the screen, pointed directly into the diffuser. Here you can see what one bank illuminated looks like driven from that 33 volt source. To hit 220 nits after going through both the diffuser and the polarizer, the LEDs have to be really bright, so bright that you can't look directly at them. If you look at the lens flare, you can see that there's one burned out LED. I killed that one a while back while testing how much current I could push through the strip. In the monitor, the strip runs right against the metal chassis, so it has some heat sinking, but I was running them naked. And without that heat sinking, they rapidly get much too hot to touch. Now's a good time to talk about how I intend to control these LEDs. I don't want to mess with the controller board. I've done it before and it was a bad idea. Most commercially available LED driver ICs are smart, so they have protection features to prevent overcurrent, and will even error out if no current is being drawn, like say if I'm trying to strobe them. So because the OEM driver board is no good for DIY strobing, I needed to take complete external control of the LED strip, voltage, current, and pulse duration. Here's the theory of operation. I'm going to use an Arduino and some transistors to control the four banks individually. This gives me control of when and how long the LCDs are lit. For this quick test with individual LEDs, I had them fire sequentially from top to bottom. I'd hoped to use this same scheme with the four banks in the backlight to help control crosstalk, but the panel's diffuser is too good at diffusing, which I'll show in a bit. So the only real option is to pulse the LEDs all together. While Arduino boards are capable of powering a few LEDs on a test breadboard, they can't run an LED backlight. For that, I needed to use an external power source. In this case, just a run-of-the-mill AC to DC adapter. This one is rated for 600 milliamps at 9 volts, which is more than enough power, but I need 33 volts, not 9. To increase the voltage, I'm using a $10 buck boost converter. This nifty little module will take the input voltage from the power brick and step it up to the 33 or more volts necessary to drive the LEDs. This one has two adjustment pots, one to adjust voltage and the other to limit current. All that's left to do now is take out the four little LEDs and plug in the six lead backlight connector. Hold on to your butts. Ho ho ho, and it works. I was actually a little surprised that nothing exploded or caught fire. With that test successful, I set the backlight to continuous operation and plugged in the panel. Before I started pulsing the backlight, I wanted to see how far and how bright I could push the LEDs. By stepping up the voltage on the boost converter, I was able to push the screen up to 300 nits before I got nervous about the very hot metal chassis on the right side of the screen. I think I could have pushed them a bit further, but I didn't want to burn out the LEDs before I even began playing around with strobing, so I backed off the voltage a bit and reassembled the monitor. So here it is a Dell P2212H with 60 Hz backlight strobing. Take that, ViewSonic! But before I congratulate myself too much, I want to go back and compare what ViewSonic was doing with PureXP on the XG270. The ultra setting on that monitor looked amazing in motion, and it achieved that by using a very short backlight pulse of only 0.85 milliseconds, but then I complained about it being too dark. Well, I ran into the exact same issue with my Frankenstrobe Dell. At short pulse durations, around one millisecond, I just could not run enough current through the LEDs to get the brightness to acceptable levels. So to meet my 100 nit goal, which is what my 18 year old CRT can do, I had to settle for a 2.17 millisecond strobe. So how does it look? Well, before I show some pursuit shots, I need to go back to the strobe crosstalk issue I touched on earlier. If crosstalk is unavoidable, and in my case it is, a good strobing mode should present the cleanest part of the image with the least amount of crosstalk right in the center of the screen. I needed a way to modify the phase of the strobe, so I added in a potentiometer that would subtly adjust the duration of the frame time. The pot allows me, in real time, to steer the crosstalk up and down the screen. This works pretty well, at least for a while. I'm not polling the VGA signal for VSync, so my Arduino's timings eventually drift out of phase with the monitor's timings, but as I said in the beginning, that's a problem for another video. I also mentioned earlier that a segmented backlight could help reduce crosstalk, especially with the long 16.7 millisecond scanout. 
but let me show you why I had to stick with a global strobe. LCD diffusers are too good at diffusing. If I disconnect one of the LED banks, the area right in front of those LEDs goes dark, but light from the other LEDs spreads throughout the panel. Without physically cutting the diffuser into four horizontal segments, the sequential strobe idea doesn't work. I might actually go ahead and do that, but again, another video. So, how'd I do? Did I beat the ViewSonic XG270? Uh, no. In retrospect, I was never going to be able to get my 60Hz strobing bliss with this Dell. Its TN panel is too slow, and the 60Hz scanout is too long. But let's finally get to some pursuit shots of both Frog Pursuit and Test UFO. And we'll start with Frog Pursuit. Huh. The primary image is relatively clean, so there's that. I set the strobe duration at 2.17 milliseconds, but that's still too long to produce anywhere near CRT levels of clarity. But the rest of the image is a mini disaster. Those long 50 plus millisecond undershooting pixel transitions from earlier show up here as distinct trailing ghosts that get frozen in time by each 60 hertz backlight pulse. Compared to the XG270 at 120 hertz, the difference is drastic. Let's check test UFO as well. Here I've set the panning speed to 1440 pixels per second to match Frog Pursuit, but the same issues show up. The primary image is clean-ish, but I can make out three ghost images behind the UFO, which at 60 hertz is a lot of time for those responses to be lingering. Again, the XG270 looks so much better. And both of these were best case scenarios for my DIY strobed monitor, right in the center of the screen. But the top and bottom are going to be worse. Let's take a look at the top. Here the backlight is capturing the next frame developing, so in addition to all the ghosts, we don't even get a clean primary image. Now, surprisingly, the XG270 also doesn't do great at the top of the screen, but it's strobing twice as often. Pure XP at 60Hz on that monitor could be amazing, if only ViewSonic allowed it. Okay, so clearly I have not DIY'd a $25 monitor into the ultimate CRT replacement. If I were to put on my reviewer's hat, I'd say my 60Hz backlight strobing mode is bad. It's too dark, the pulse duration is too long, the panel's response times are ridiculously slow, and strobe crosstalk ruins the image across most of the screen. But if I took off that hat and threw it in the garbage, and then put on my much more stylish and cool monitor nerd hat, I'd change my tune. I'd say I'm breaking new ground and innovating in the LCD monitor space. But jokes aside, I really enjoyed this little project. And my point wasn't to really do better with a DIY microcontroller hack than manufacturers could do properly and easily with firmware. The point was just that. But right now, finally, I can play the Crew 2 with backlight strobing. And if I just ignore the top third and bottom third of the screen, it doesn't look too bad. But it's remarkable that I had to go through so much trouble to do so. Monitor manufacturers employ talented actual engineers who could implement 60 hertz strobing modes much, much better than I ever could, so why don't we see them? Is the flicker at 60 hertz really that bad? I don't think so. It's clear that you wouldn't want to use it for general desktop use, but that also holds true for strobing modes in general. ELMB on Asus's VG27AQ is not a desktop feature, it's a gaming feature. You turn it on for games and then you turn it off for everything else. The same could and should hold true for 60 hertz strobing. If manufacturers are worried about people getting eye strain or headaches, which is curiously something that the much more mass market TV guys apparently don't care about, put up a disclaimer or hide it somewhere in the OSD. Surely I can't be the only one who wants this, right? Anyhow, I hope you've enjoyed watching this little backlight strobing project. I'd like to keep it going. First up would be tapping the V-Sync signal from the VGA cable so I can keep a consistent strobe phase. But then, I may actually try cutting the backlight diffuser into four segments. That won't make the panel any faster, but it should help with the crosstalk. If you have any suggestions to make this better, or even what I should do with it next, let me know. Bye for now.